Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is David Patrick Carey with Church of the Eternal Logos, and I am joined by the author of The Return of the Dragon, which is what we'll be discussing today, Lewis Unget. Did I pronounce your last name right? You got it, man. You got hey, it. Hey, yeah, thanks for How you doing today, brother? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Just uh, staying busy. Yeah. Uh, thanks for coming on, and I want to give you a special thank you for sending me your book. Uh, this was a uh, multiple months back, and I finally got ra- around to reading it probably about a month and a half, two months ago, and I really enjoyed it. And cool. uh, I am looking forward to sort of unpacking it with everybody so that they become a, mil- a little bit more familiar with it. Um, but uh, maybe to begin with, I'm sure some people aren't going to be familiar with your book or your work. Do you mind introducing yourself? Um, sure. And maybe we can get into your work uh, regards to 
the history of psychedelic use and sort of how that relates to aspects of different cultures, societies, and why Christianity has historically been antagonistic towards it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my name is, uh, as you said, Louis Hungit, and um, I write on a whole bunch of different subjects, religion, um, science, uh, technology, um, and culture as a whole. Um, I have always kind of been interested in those intersection of those things, um, but not so interested in psychedelics. I did um, goof around with them a little bit when I was in college and, and high school level, um, but it had never been a part of my life, never had been something that uh, I had been incredibly focused on to any great degree. Mm -hmm. um, and then it, it started to come across my radar, just um, listening to episodes of Joe Rogan. He promotes <laughs> psychedelics all the time, listening right. to um, Graham Hancock. I read his book, um, America Before, and he talks about psychedelics in that book. Um, I read uh, Brian Muir Rescue's um, yeah. Immortality Key, and he makes the case that Christianity had psychedelics in it. And um, just kind of observing um, publicly what's going on with psychedelics, um, marijuana is legal everywhere now. Um, it was legal, illegal everywhere 20 years ago. So just this dramatic shift in the legalization of marijuana and much right. heavier psychedelics are being legalized. I just saw a story that uh, California is very close to legalizing all um, psychedelics um, in California. Yeah, yeah. Um, other states uh, ha are moving that way or already have moved that way. Um, so just seeing kind of this cultural push it has really sparked my interest in the last few years. Um, and they, the other thing that really um, kind of stoked my interest was um, when I started to listen to both Graham Hancock and Joe Rogan, um, and they started to talk about uh, what happened when they took a particular psychedelic called uh, DMT, um, yep. dimethyltryptamine, which is the uh, chemical component behind ayahuasca, um, which is a drug that was taken, basically a tea, a mix, a brew that was taken by the Incas in Mesoamerica. And um, so I started to read about what they were talking about in their context. And I think my cam just broke. Hopefully that doesn't, isn't a problem. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I've had all kinds of computer problems here. So let me, uh, let me try switching to an external camera and see if that okay. works here. Hold on. Yep. Um, while you're doing that, uh, shout out to our sister, Rachel Wilson, who renews her YouTube membership here at uh, Church of the Eternal Logos and says, big congratulations on the 20,000, my friend. Well deserved. Well, thank you so much, Rachel. And we will be doing a big 20,000 celebration stream Sunday. In fact, I was going to text you, Rachel, you and Andrew. Um, I was going to, again, this would be, see if you guys could hop on uh, briefly but we're going to be doing a big one, uh, reviewing a lot of stuff. I'm going to reach out to all, all the ortho friends and see if they're going to be able to join. But, tw but Sunday will be our 20,000 subscriber celebration stream. I'm very grateful uh, that, that was, that was a milestone we've been able to achieve. So thank you so much. I really appreciate that. All right. I think, you're, I think your camera's good now. Yeah. All right. Cool. Good. Yeah, good. Yes. Sorry. Uh, sorry about that. I've had... As you know, as I was getting logged on, I've had all kinds of computer problems today, so I'm not sure if uh, somebody dropped it or what is going on. But hey, it's, uh, it's, hopefully, I can get spirit to the air, stuff. man. That's They're, right. <laughs> they don't want us to talk about this because I think the way that you framed uh, your book, I think this is a again, no matter where people are coming from, uh, this is what I think is so beneficial about your book is it kind of gives the groundwork where if you're not familiar with what psychedelics are or you are familiar, um, it hits on a lot of the, the important points. And I loved, again, the, the theme of it is the return of the dragon. And you highlight serpent worship, uh, dragon mythology, and how this relates to the use of pharmacia and all this different stuff. So I'm really excited to get into all that stuff. And we can kind of give yeah. a chronological overview of the book. But to begin, why did you write this book? You said you're kind of getting interested in these topics. They're yeah, so I got popular. interested in these topics. Um, I had 
heard about DMT. So DMT yeah. ayahuasca, um, heard about that, heard about the experiences people had. And one, I started to read some of the scientific studies, like just out of interest, because it's very interesting what people say. People say they right. see entities. They yep. say these entities um, talk to them. Um, people take DMT, come down from DMT and say that the beings that they saw continue to exist when they're not on DMT. So here you have people yep. that are otherwise perfectly sane, otherwise perfectly um, normal people that are able to kind of uh, function in society. Some people that are very accomplished. You know, a lot of the people in these studies are, you'll see them and they're people that are executives or they're people that are uh, accomplished uh, upper management within corporations or whatever. So they're not, these aren't crazy drifters that are coming up and they'll say, no, what I saw was real. And the interesting thing is people will see the same stuff regardless of cultural background. So you'll see people, um, you know, uh, tribes in, in Mesoamerica will take it. Uh, a hippie from North America will take it. And a businessman from Australia will take it and they'll see the same shapes that look like mm -hmm. uh, Aztec shapes. They'll see entities. They'll talk about the same experiences that they had, the same feelings that they had. And um, when I saw this, I was, I was, it struck me like, what is going on? What could that be? Um, what could it, could it be caught? What could be the cause behind all those things? Right. And why do people that are otherwise, the interesting thing about DMT is the majority of people that take it, that were atheists going in, cease to be atheists afterwards. Right. Um, so why would someone that's very skeptical of kind of supernatural, multidimensional things, someone that is by definition rejecting any kind of spiritual component, why after they take it, do they say, oh, that was real? Right. And that's what really sent me down the rabbit hole. That's what really got me to research it. Um, I went into, as you know, from reading the book, I went into the history of it. I went right. into the science of it. I went into the philosophy of it. I went into the theology of it and kind of approached it from all those angles. On my personal background, which I didn't talk about at all, is I do have a seminary degree. Um, I have a um, science degree for my undergraduate. I also have a, a business degree as well. So I've got kind of a diverse background, which I think is kind of necessary to tackle a subject like this right. adequately. Um, so that's how I got into it. And, and I, you know, I don't know where you want to go from there. Yeah. We well, well yeah, I got a whole series. So <laughs> okay. uh, you said you, I'm curious your background into psychedelics, because as yeah. people watching, I sounds like I was much more into it than maybe, maybe you were sort of a, uh, periphery activity you did with your friends. I know you mentioned uh, a few throwing down a few shrooms with some friends on a, on a yeah. couch, but um, I have done ayahuasca DMT multiple times, LSD. Um, uh, yeah. So, so I did. I would, um, yeah. When I was uh, in kind of college age, uh -huh. um, I did I didn't do ayahuasca, but I did all the other stuff. Yeah. And um, I wouldn't say it was like a not peripheral, uh, peripheral thing. I, at the time, it felt really important. Okay. At the time, it felt like it was this transformative thing. I think it's hard to do those things without feeling that way. Um, the reason I got away from it mostly was um, that I thought it, I, I wasn't particularly Christian back then, but I, I felt it had a, um, it was doing damage to my soul. Like I just, right. I, I felt there was, um, I was losing my connection with the real world. And so I just, I got rid of that in my life and got rid of, um, pretty much all drugs, um, from my life at that point in time. Um, just cause I thought it was harmful. Um, so, right. uh, that, that, that's kind of my background with it. So it's, it's not something that I haven't experienced, not something I haven't done. And that's one of the things that is funny. My book, to some degree, points to the dangers of it and puts up a warning sign. And every time I, I, I end up talking to kind of people that are very pro-drug, they'll say, well, you just haven't done enough. And my, I'm like, <laughs> yeah. my book is like warning people not to do it. <laughs> you know, so like, right. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's where I... I appreciated the the sober mind because this is a difficult topic to speak about from a Christian perspective. And for those listening, you are Catholic, correct? Um, yeah. So, uh, and we can talk about my religious background. It's, yeah. uh, short answer is it's complicated. I've been, um, like I said, I have a seminary degree and that's from a Protestant institution. Okay. So um, I've got a um, very diverse background, but I was baptized and confirmed Catholic growing up and um 
right now I'm kind of trying to figure out where I'm going. So I'm, I'm in, in the middle of, of that. Now, with that being said, I'm convinced that Christianity is true and um, am uh, and confident of that piece of it, but uh, right. kind of, kind of um, working through the out right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Okay. Yeah. Understandable. So to begin with, I want to get into the, the rising popularity of psychedelics because you highlight some really important people like Graham Hancock. People are going to be familiar with his um, books in regards to the fingerprints of the gods, looking at what is often referred to as astro theology, the redating of the pyramids, uh, the Sphinx. And then more recently, once that sort of came into prominence, I mean, I think that was written in the 90s, but certainly after about 2010, 11, 12, he kind of became more popular on Joe Rogan, talking about ayahuasca, um, his experiences with psychedelics, how that informs his understanding of spirituality and religion. You mentioned uh, Michael Pollan in the uh, book, which he has his uh, more, what is it? How to Change Your Mind is the name how of it. I have mind. it over yep. here. Yep. And his is like the academic take on this psychedelic or the, the return of the psychedelic phenomenon from the 60s into the 21st century. And in, in Brian Morescu's book, who I've been very critical of, um, it, it's a again, I have that one. The immortality key is like this thick. And yet the lack of any sophistication in regards to Christian theology, Christian history, Christian tradition. He'll cite a Gnostic gospel. He'll cite the synoptic gospel. He'll take this word over here and then equate it. For example, one of them, uh, I remember just do, reading that book and being so annoyed uh, with the the whole thing is like he was talking about in Mount, Mount Athos, one of the monasteries is famous for this saying across the doorway that if you die before you die, you won't die when you die. And he took that saying as equating it to the use of psychedelics and how the, the near death experience on psychedelics was the basis of like the, it, it was it was the remnant of the Alicinian mysteries at, on Mount Athos. Like, no, dude, like dying to the world through your will. It takes context. It takes nuance. You have to know like why people are saying certain things and where they're coming from. So you yeah. hit on a lot of the popular Joe Rogan. You bring up Joe Rogan in this book. Again, that's where a lot of people are being exposed to DMT and these psychedelic substances. Um, let's speak, or if you can, to the growing popularity and, and how you see the sort of resurgence, because I definitely agree with you. Again, the premise of this book, The Return of the Dragon, is you're highlighting that many of the presuppositions of psychedelic spirituality, psychedelic religion and culture, um, uh, what you don't say, but what I would agree, I would agree with Terrence McKenna here is that they dissolve boundaries. And one of the things that we're seeing in society is this continual dissolution of boundaries between man and women, uh, man and animal, man and machine, uh, national boundaries, all types yeah. of boundaries are being eroded. And this for me is a sort of chaotic chaotic scene where the logos and logos theology is about the ordering of the world and keeping things in their correct context and, and maintaining boundaries, which I think is a masculine imperative. But, but you highlight that this sort of serpentine ancient religion, which you get, I love the, my favorite part was all the serpent uh, metaphors in the Bible and how you tied that with pharmacia. I thought that was, yeah. I loved my favorite part of it, but your, the general premise is that this reigniting of the 1960s counterculture, whatever is happening with the marijuana and the psychedelic scene in the contemporary period, is a sort of uh, reigniting of an ancient tradition. Can you speak a little bit to this and, again, why it's called the return of the dragon and this rising sure. uh, growth of, of psychedelic popularity? Yeah, so the thing that a lot of people don't realize is that in the ancient world, um, the use of drugs as part of shamanism, as part of kind of typical paganistic religions was very widespread, very common, um, all, present almost everywhere. Um, so when the Spanish, for example, showed up on at in what is now Mexico, Mesoamerica, interacted with the Aztecs, they saw them consuming mushrooms and watching them kind of go crazy after they consume the mushrooms. Um, you go back further um, and you look at um, the world of Northern Europe, 
Um, we know for a fact that many of these tribes, many of these uh, regions would consume psychedelics as part of their religion or as part of uh, their uh, rituals that they, they followed. Um, in the case of uh, the Vikings, for example, they took uh, stinking, uh, st stinking hembrane. They, they took, mm -hmm. um, uh, in the case of um, many of these tribes, we don't know exactly what they were taking, but they would say that they were, would take were taking things, right? They would talk about the fact that they had consumed uh, particular drugs. Um, in um, some of these cases, we do know what they were taking. Um, Amanita muscaria, we know yeah. that the, m most likely was being consumed by the, what is now the Irish in, in Gaelic uh, history. Um, so that a lot of people don't realize that. It was very right. common, very widespread um, to the point where um, the word for witchcraft in the ancient Greek and the word for drugs in the ancient Greek are the same word as right. pharmakia. Um, so in the, the Hellenistic world, they were so closely associated that they literally had the same word. Right. Um, that has always been true. And one of the things I talk about in my book is the, the one place that's been an exception is in Christendom. Um, the one place where, drugs has not been, despite what Brian Mirosko tried to argue, drugs right. has not been widely spread. Um, the drugs has not been considered an authentic form of Christianity or of, of religion is in Christianity. Right. So right. as Christianity spread, you don't see your priests tripping out as they see their visions. You don't see um, people come to church and get mushrooms in their, as, as their Lord's supper. Um, you see them, uh, come they take a little bit of wine not enough to get drunk paul's clear that you shouldn't take enough to get drunk uh, a little bit of bread and that's the extent and christians have always practiced alcohol um and i talk about on i have an article on my website on my Substack that talks about the difference between alcohol and um psychedelic drugs uh, but beyond alcohol other drugs have just have not been permitted within christianity right. um and I, one of the things as I kind of go through history in my book, as I get up to the 20th century and I talk about people uh, like Havelock Ellis, or I talk about people um, like R. Gordon Wasson, mm -hmm. um, who reintroduced these things into yep. society, re brought them back in. Um, Timothy Leary brought them back in. Al Hubbard brought them back in. And all of a sudden you see um, this being normalized, uh, this being considered something that is opens your mind, ex expands your consciousness. Um, but it, it actually was surprisingly, you know, as much as we think of the hippies and, and all that as um, the introduction of these things, um, it was surprisingly not accepted, you know, back then. Um, right. the, the Controlled Substances Act was overwhelmingly popular, um, and that was 1971. Um, the number of people doing marijuana back then, obviously it's hard to tell on something like that, but when Gallup did a poll in 1971 on how many people were, had said that they had tried marijuana, um, it was only like 4% of the people that said they had tried marijuana. Now you do that same poll, Gallup did that same poll, it's 50%. Right. So you've gone from 4% to 50%. And by the way, marijuana in 1971 was nowhere near as psychedelic as marijuana in 2023. Yeah, the, the act of THC wasn't nearly yeah. uh, at the level now. Now you go to a dispensary, a dispensary it's common between 20% to 30% right. uh, or higher THC, active THC. So yeah, you make a great point. And, and to steel ban the other person's argument, obviously we're both Christian and we're going to speak um, – in advocacy for um, a sort of condemnation of these practices for spiritual purposes. But what I do appreciate in the book is that you highlight the John Hopkins studies. The people who are advocates for psychedelics want to point to the ability to rid themselves of addictions. Um, you know, yeah. there was noteworthy experiments with Leary and his time at the Harvard, uh, Harvard University doing the psychedelic research on alcoholics taking LSD, a boga with heroin addicts um, or, or any type of 
uh, opioid addiction, um, depression, PTSD, which again, if they dissolve boundaries, it makes sense why they would help you get over a traumatic experience. You take this inebriating substance and you're filled with a lot of different emotions, but you can confront these traumas that you've been dealing with and then eventually get over them by, again, this this absolute dissolution of boundaries in many different ways. Yeah. But Terrence McKenna would argue that the what we're in favor of, of the psych, of why psychedelics wouldn't be permitted, he would say this is the male ego of the dominator culture, right? So the problem yeah. with people who don't take psychedelics is that they become more masculinely oriented because they become deeper entrenched into their own psychological egos and that these egoic structures are sort of a metastasization of a neurosis and that yeah. really we're like communal entities and we need to because you talk about telepathy you talk about certain ex, you know phenomenological experiences on psychedelics which i've experienced myself um and and they would argue well this is what we're supposed to be this is the height of spirituality um but one of the difficulties with the psychedelic groups is is objectivity. I did a whole stream allowing psychedelic people to come on and explain to me if psychedelics lead to enlightenment. And one of the problems every single person had is they had no ability to talk about objective truth, objective, so objective epistemology, objective morality, um, anything objective, because it's just about, oh, well, whatever you experience during these ecstatic states, it must be true. That must that must yeah. be the true spirituality. That must be the true thing. And so to give them uh, their and steel man their argument, they would say, well, you and I, we're just too egoic and we're not we're not willing or we're actually afraid of the full dissolution of our of our boundaries in the in the ego death experience. Um, yeah. But you you point out in the book that this phenomenon of drug use is tied to human sacrifice um you know usually multiple instances of psychedelic cults being uh, engaging in like orgiastic activity during full moon uh, so limiting uh, male paternity there because if women are pregnant during an orgy nobody knows who the actual father is um so many aspects of psychedelic spirituality are totally in opposition or antagonistic to the Christian worldview. And so hopefully we can talk a little bit about why that is and why we would argue that's a good thing. But um, wherever you want to go next into the book, I know we kind of discussed on the reemergence. Well, can I uh, just yeah, address ahead. that um, Terrence McKenna thing? Because he did yeah. mention that. I, I Was that Food of the Gods, I believe? He yeah. Mentioned that. And yeah, so, and um, I remember reading that and thinking, yeah, that's what they want. They want men to be less masculine. They want men to be less, um, less uh, sure and defenders of society. And you know, this, th those aspects. I mean, there's an assumption there that th those things are bad things about who we are. And I would say those are not bad things. Those are things that we should embrace, and those things are good. Um, but the other big thing that I talk about and the thing that I think is so dangerous about that is when you talk about removing boundaries, there's boundaries between human beings, right? And maybe right. it does remove those boundaries. However, if you're, unless you're an atheist, which I'm not sure if Terrence McKenna is or not, I don't think he is. Or, no, he, you know, he, so. he, he would identify as something, uh, a sort of a platonic spiritualist. Right. He always identified yeah. himself as a Platonist. So unless you're an atheist, uh, you believe in entities beyond just other human beings. Right. Um, and the thing kind of spoiler alert from my book is that I go into who are the entities people see while they're on DMT and other drugs. You know, who who are they that we're interacting with and what are those boundaries that get taken down? And um, the case that I make in the book, and you touch on some of it, is that at least some of these entities, I would argue all of these entities don't have human interests in mind. And in fact, they have human hatred in mind. And so when you reduce those boundaries between us and those entities that people are interacting with, um, I think you're opening yourself up to some incredibly dangerous space uh, that yeah. you're walking into. And um, I think uh, that is for me, the biggest twist, the biggest uh, concern with all of this is at the fundamental root or fundamental core of, of what the issue is, is it's not about us. It's about what 
those other things. And, uh, you know, my case that I make is that the people that say those are real entities, like Graham Hancock says, like uh, Joe Rogan says, those entities that you interact with, um, that they are real entities. And we right. have to take that seriously. And I and agree. We, and we both agree that. So we, for somebody watching, you say, oh, well, they're just dismissing the psychedelic experiences as some, uh, you know, uh, mental, Im imaginal space. No, I think both of us would argue no, the, I would say the entities are real, that you can actually contact non-local entities. And this has to do with then understanding as from especially orthodox theology is much more explicit on the noetic realm. And that the place in which we engage angels and demons, whether good or bad, is in the imagination. And that the imagination is actually a point of which we can participate with noetic entities. As you highlight in the book, angels and demons from Christian theology are intellect with will noetic entities and we are noetic but also physical material and so i agreeing with you for anybody listening who we there are some people that are pro psychedelic um we are not dismissing that these entities are fake we're saying that yeah. they're real but how do you know what they're telling you is true or good advice and that's yes. where again the breakdown in their ability i've never met somebody who's able to actually provide a sort of philosophical foundation to objectivity because they can't. Yeah. And the advice that's given and the kind of the help when you ask people, how were you helped? Um, and the, the, the advice almost always is some sort of Hallmark greeting. It's like, love everyone or yep. um, embrace the moment or, uh, you know, be who you are or whatever. You know, there, there's always some Hallmark greeting that literally anybody could have come up with. Um, and that's kind of like what makes people when they try to articulate what it is they're experiencing that's what makes people say that it's a good thing right. um but the thing i point out is that that's not a good way to determine if something's good or bad right, right. so if if you met a person that came up to you and was real friendly and said hey i'll help you mow your lawn i'll help you you know take your kids to daycare or whatever you you would be a fool to just assume that that's a good person. If they're a stranger, if you'd never met them before, you'd right. be a fool just to say, yeah, yeah, take my kids here, you know, here, take my credit card and, you know, go like, you'd be crazy <laughs> to do that. So that's, you know, someone being nice or someone maybe giving some very surface level good advice or whatever um, is not a good way to judge it. And um, I talk about the fact that scripturally, when you get into the Bible and you get into, and I, this is true also, if you read the lives of the saints, um, but scripturally, you don't being good or being a joyful thing to see is not the sign of a good spirit. So you go through the Bible and you say, what is the entity that engaged Adam and Eve? Well, he seemed reasonable, right? The serpent approached her, made some nice arguments. He gave her kind of empowered her. He said, Hey, if you do this, you'll become like a God. And, right. you know, so like on the surface level, a lot of people would hear what the devil said or what the serpent said to Eve in the garden. And on the surface level, a lot of people would say that was really good advice. Um, when <laughs> the, the devil came to Jesus in the last and his temptation in the desert, um, he said, Hey, you know, you need, you're hungry. Why don't you turn that stone into bread? That's, that's a helpful thing. Let me show you how to, um, get the, the kingdom. So all you have to do is do bow down to me right. and, and you can have all the kingdoms of the world. And so on some level, here's the devil again, helpfully helping Jesus in his time of, of weakness, his time of struggle in the desert. And, um, in contrast in the Bible, when, angels come over and over e almost every single time people are struck with fear they're terrified when they see the angels they fall down on their knees um and one of the first thing the angel almost always has to say is be not afraid you know be not afraid because people are terrified of angels and um so when it comes to like judging from a christian perspective judging good entities versus bad entities being really friendly and giving some quick nice advice is probably an indication that it's a bad entity just right. based on what we see. And again, that's true in the lives of saints as well. I didn't really get into that in the book, but um, you yeah. have all kinds of saints that warn against um, entities that come as though they're these nice beings of light or whatever. Um, and, and that's one of the things that when you talked about the encountering of the entities, 
It reminded me again of Terrence McKenna and his multiple stories of his conversations with the mushroom and how it always coincides with really the agenda, the, the normative agenda at will right now on, on the planet regarding centralized power, one world government, dissolution of boundaries, depopulation. I mean, the first thing that the mushroom told Terrence McKenna was, hey, uh, we need you, you need to limit the amount of people on the planet. Now, again, yeah. from a Christian perspective, anybody who is pregnant, anybody who is a baby growing as, as in the womb, God has already ordained them to exist. So God decides how many people there are. You can have sex and not get pregnant. Uh, so there's a mystery to it. And the idea that we're going to limit uh, people and their ability to be here, I, I love, or what I immediately thought is tying it into the history of human sacrifice, which you highlight with various groups that performed psychedelic rituals or had serpentine or dragon-like gods that they would worship and how often it was tied to offering a human in exchange for some type of worldly assurance or success or productivity. Yeah. And you think of then what the mushrooms telling Terrence McKenna and his big message towards the end of the 1980s was, oh, yeah, women, Western women should only have one child at most. And if you do, just go have an abortion. And I look at the modern day use of abortion as the continuation of this human sacrifice. And I see it totally tied with the same general spirituality of like feeling good and social justice and these abstract ways in which we express our morality and our ethical behavior. It's very easy to just say you're for a cause and actually be really good to the person that you don't really like. Like that yeah. takes a lot more effort. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that reality of, you know, if you if you think of these entities, if you say hypothetically, you know, they're human hating, what would they do? Well, if you don't want humans around, the first thing you say is, hey, there's too many humans on the earth. You guys need to get rid of humans. You need to have less children, right? So that that is something exactly what you would do if you hate humans is you would say, Hey, have less, less children, um, have fewer children. And you would also promote abortion. Um, one of the things I mentioned in my book very briefly, um, is the fact that, um, Planned Parenthood was started in conjunction with Havelock Ellis, who is a pioneer of the psychedelic movement, like one of the earliest psychedelic researchers and one of the earliest promoters of, of psychedelia. Um, and you know, that, that was Planned Parenthood, which is in the U S the largest abortion provider, um, was started, started in part by him. He was close friends and lover with, uh, Margaret, uh, Sanger. Um, and so there's, there's something going on there and there's a connection there. Um, one of the interesting things as you go back through history and, and you touched on it a little bit, um, but my book has a chapter, um, called the serpent and the sacrifice, I believe. And it's goes through the fact that people in almost every culture, number one, like I mentioned earlier, take a variety of psychedelic drugs of some sort. Number two, see visions of some sort of serpent. So tying into that Adam and Eve story, they'll see a vision of a serpent. Um, for example, uh, I go through them all in my book, but Mesoamerica is a great example where they worshiped uh, Quichuacuatl, um, the serpent entity, a you know, serpent with wings, basically. Um, and so they, they take drugs, they worship serpents, and then they sacrifice often children. Um, and that happens over and over again. Um, you know, throughout history, you see it in Bible times. Um, I there's a book uh, that I cite in uh, in my book um, by uh, Wilson is the name of the guy. He's a researcher at Yale. It's called The Serpent um, and the Ancient Near East, I believe. The Serpent Myth and the Ancient Near East. Um, but he talks about the fact that this combination of the serpent entity and human sacrifice is a datum in the ancient world that every time people start worshiping a serpent, they start sacrificing people. Um, and um, you definitely, like I said, in Mesoamerica, that's the clearest picture The reading the Spanish writings um, when they first came to meet with the Aztecs is crazy um, where they'll literally say, Hey, I saw this guy take this mushroom. Um, then he went out and practiced cannibalism or whatever. And um, there, there's just this, this link between those three. And kind of my theory on it, my I think the underlining uh, underlying 
case that I make is we talked about is that you're seeing something real and that whatever that is reveals himself or herself as a serpent um, in some way. And whatever that is, doesn't like humans very much. And if they can get you to um, have fewer children, they'll get you to have fewer children. If they can get you to have an abortion, they'll have an abortion. If they can get you to sacrifice children to the sun god, they'll get you to sacrifice children to the sun god. It's really, a, a for, for me, I think that's the core and that's the shocking truth behind it. And I wrote this book and you know, I mentioned I'm a Christian, but I wrote this book really from a almost a secular skeptical standpoint so if people read this book it's not like i'm like here's what the bible says you know here's this you know three point three biblical reasons why you shouldn't do drugs or whatever that's not how this book is written it's written really for me question was um are these entities real? Is, you know, are, are people really interacting with demons? I never thought that going in. I was not like a, a mindset that I had in any way, shape or form, but it's something that kind of confronted me as I started to do the research. Can you hear me? No, I can hear you. No. Okay. Oh, yeah. okay. Sorry, Sorry, something something uh, yeah. got muted over here. I think we're good now. So, okay. All right. Are, 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 did you change headphones? Because your audio is a little different now. Oh, it is? Okay. I did not change headphones, but I was playing around with it because I thought it may have been my headphones. No, it was so. mine. My bad. I was. Okay. Uh, it, yeah. it accidentally got muted on my end. I was trying okay. to say, did you miss that whole thing that I assumed the whole, everything I said? I missed needed. everything you said. Yep, yeah. Yep. Like no I worries, said, I no thought worries. it was mine because I had problems earlier. No so. worries. Yeah. It was the, thank you for the chat. Let me know that the, the mute button got hit. Um, so what I was saying was we were talking about, uh, let's see, starting back, I first mentioned about mama ayahuasca and how she often presents herself as a serpent. And so it, through my own experiences with, uh, various, psychedelics, DMT, ayahuasca, LSD, psilocybin, I did see serpentine imagery. And often it's sort of wrapped in a Gnostic interpretation that uh, when they read, so you're talking about Eve and the temptation of the serpent, they read that as a positive thing because they use this sort of Marcionite understanding of the Old Testament as a different deity than Jesus Christ or the New Testament and that he was enslaving humanity, you know, the whole Yadaboeth uh, Demiurge thing. And that's common within psychedelic culture. Psychedelic culture in spirituality, as I've highlighted, is in essence Gnostic, because the whole point is to go into these inebriated states and acquire that information and knowledge. Yeah. And so. Um, yeah. And I will say on that, um, that is such a common theme. So I, I go through the history of my book, but just after writing the book, publishing the book, it's been very well received. So many people have le left uh, wonderful comments and reached out to me. And s over and over again, people say, I saw serpents. I interacted with serpents. <laughs> like, it's just like, right. such a common thing um, for so many different people. And um, one of the interesting things is uh, Graham Hancock, um, when he inter when he took ayahuasca, he says he interacts with the serpent all the time. Um, I quote this in my book, but he says, very commonly, these entities appear as serpents or serpent human hybrids. Mother Ayahuasca herself is frequently depicted as a serpent. Yep. I have met her in this form many times. Um, so that I think that was in actually the preface to Brian Norescu's book. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it's, it's such a common theme. And I mean, the interesting thing is 
you know, you, you said they're Gnostics, which I agree with 100% with you on that. But the other thing they are is if they're bowing down to the serpent, they're also Satanists. Right. right. So I hate to sound like Alex Jones, but like literally, if as Christians, we believe that that serpent is the great Satan, which is what the book of Revelation says, right. um, then at the core, they're bowing down to Satan, which is Satan worship. And that sounds extreme. And I hate to I, like I'm sounding like this extreme fire breathing creature. Um, but these are all like uh, conclusions I came to that I didn't believe going in at right. all. And I really try and make the case in this book um, to anyone that um, is fair minded. Um, so in other words, you don't need to you don't need to have that view going into it. And I didn't have that view going into right. starting my research. Um, Luta, something that really I think was. your I think your microphone got switched because it's a little okay. bit less clear to hear you now. OK, let me um, check your settings. But I want to yeah, I want to continue on 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 that um, because the this the serpent thing and and the Gnosticism, when you talked about them being Satanist, I would say the way that they're Satan is not like they're theistic Satanists. Obviously, the Church of Satanists, if you're getting into LaVey's orientation, they'd say they're atheists. You have the Church of Set, which is a theistic form of Satanism. They're Satanists in the sense that they worship themselves. And that's what the evil one tries to get us all to do. And that's what Christ is trying to get you not to do. And so the psychedelics, because of this pursuit of like divine gnosis through these ecstatic experiences, and then this realization that everybody is one, we're all the same person. It's like, well, you can just love to love God. You just need to love yourself more. And Christianity says the exact opposite. And so this point in which how we how we how we work with and commune with the other within the psychedelic stuff, it's often just a revalidation and valorization of oneself. That's what makes it satanic because that's how Lucifer fell in the first place yeah. is that he wanted to be worshipped. And these things kind of get people into this paradigm of thought where, well, OK, I don't see God. I take psychedelics. I realize, oh, well, I'm one with everything. I'm one with the universe. In fact, I'm God. I'm the sentient part of the universe. Yeah. I need to love me more. I need to express my truth more. And this yeah. is then how this comes the basis of their spirituality. And it's it's so subtle, but it's an entirely different orientation towards the world than the Christian paradigm. Yeah, can you hear me now? Or yes, now you're super okay, clear perfect. again. Yeah, yeah, yep, super clear. Yeah, again. so yep. um, and it did default over to a different one there. I've had so many technical problems today. So it's all good, man. That, We're gonna yeah, get through it one way or another. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I mean that's a great point. Is that I think that when you're when you're talking about a lot of these things, a lot of people have like a presupposed of like Satanism is. When you sit down in your basement with some friends and you uh, say, hail Satan, come to me. Yeah, kill right? your cat and drink its blood. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and in, in reality, is it's very different. And a lot of these, these, um, a lot of these religions or even just experiences are intentionally, they, they'll laugh at that idea. They'll, they'll dismiss that idea as, as something that is a silly Christian idea. Um, but then they go about doing things that in many ways are exactly that, right? So there's, like you said, it's a de uh, reprioritization away from what God intended, reprioritization right. away from um, where we're supposed to go. It is a bowing down to something that we're not supposed to bow down to, those kind of things. So right. in many ways, it is exactly that. But there's an intellectual dismissal of that. Um, of And you even see that with like artists where you'll see, um, you know, Sam Smith or you see Doja Cat or whatever. Yep. And they're, they've got all this imagery. And then you say, oh, my goodness, that's satanic. And they say, ah, we're just just we're, you know, yeah, it's just we're just Joshin, yeah. or whatever yeah so um there and on some on some level like i agree that they're they they are intellectually they very well might think that they're just screwing around they very right. well might think that they're just um putting on a show trying to rile up christians or whatever um yep. the interesting thing about religion as a whole is that Within Christianity, we care a lot about what goes on in the head. We have to say the creeds. We have to agree intellectually with Christianity. Um, a lot of religions don't require that. Um, right. You go to um, Shinto, for example, you, in Japan. Um, most people there will say, 
I don't believe in anything, you know, it'll, the polls will be very high atheism rates or whatever. But if you try to sell your house and it hasn't been blessed by a Shinto priest, you can't sell it. Right. So there's, it's much closer to a superstition than to what Christians view as like a creedal religion. It's, it's right. deeds, not creeds. Right. So right. most religions are like that. Um, where it's, it doesn't matter if you, uh, believe that breaking the mirror, uh, causes seven years bad luck. It just does. Right. So don't break the mirror. It doesn't matter if you um, believe that throwing the salt over your shoulder uh, <laughs> will, will, you know, fix your bad luck after you spill the salt, just do it and you'll be taken care of. Don't, don't walk under the ladder or whatever. And th right. those are, um, that's deeds, not creeds. And that's how most religions are. Most religions are just do these things and you'll be safe. And I think ultimately that is from a, bring it back to a Christian perspective. God cares about transforming us as humans. Right. Um, other entities don't care about transforming us as humans. They just want us to do what they want us to do. Right. right. So there is a big difference between the religion that cares about who we become and the religion that is going to discard us the second it can. And um, so that's why a lot of times it's like, I don't care if you worship Satan or not, or if you, whatever, you know, whatever you're exactly worshiping, I just want you to do what I want you to do and have fewer kids. <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and the, it, there, it's so general and ambiguous. One of the things that I really also enjoyed with the book was you bringing up Jezebel. And Jezebel is uh, obviously a very popular figure in the times of the manosphere right now, because that's what you would refer to as a very promiscuous woman, a, 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 a temptuous, right? Somebody who's tempting you to do things that you shouldn't do. And Jezebel was the promiscuous, beautiful uh, wife of King Ahab, a weak man who allowed her to get Israel to go back uh, and worship Baal and perform child sacrifice and all this different stuff. And one of the things that you highlighted that I had forgotten, but was so uh, appreciative of when reading was that the way that she fooled the people was through the pharmacia. Right. And I couldn't help but think, again, post 2020 with uh, various medical procedures that were pushed on us, big pharma, generally speaking, the unhealthiness within the United States, the amount of prescription drugs, the push for the legalization of uh, mind altering substances of all sorts, that this is a sort of hypnotization, a, again, a spiritual battle that when, when you laid it out, I mean, it's clearly the, the biblical framework of how we have to watch out that the pharmacia, the sorcery, the use of drugs for spiritual purposes. And that's a key point too. It's, it's the idea that these substances lead you into gnosis, lead you into, um, a higher state of reality lead you into spiritual enlightenment. That's the problem because once you adopt that worldview and you go into these altered states, now you think whatever you're being told is coming from the Almighty or His messengers, and yeah. you have no way to d differentiate it. I was wondering now, can you speak speak a little bit to pharmacia? Uh, we you, br you brought up the word, but how does the Bible talk about it? How does we as Christians understand it? Because I yeah. think this is huge when we're talking about why is Christianity not on board with ritualistic inebriation. Um, yeah. Well, it has yep. to do with our understanding of, again, the noetic realm, but how these things are actually lead you astray. Right. Yeah. So um, one of the interesting things is people will read a Brian Murray rescue and they'll get through it and he'll kind of make the case. Yeah. Christianity must have used these things in the early days. Um, he interestingly doesn't even go through what the Bible says about it. Right. Um, and now, the interesting, the way that fools people is your average person goes to the Bible and they go online, they go to Bible Gateway or something, and they'll search for the word drugs or they'll search, search for the word mushrooms and they won't find anything. And so they'll say the Bible doesn't say anything about drugs. Um, but the, there's a fundamental problem is that the Bible wasn't written in English. Um, it was written in Greek for the New Testament, Hebrew for the Old Testament, but the Old Testament there's a Greek translation yep. called the Septuagint that the apostles used that would have been what Jesus read, would have been what Paul read, would have been what all the, the apostles read. And so in the Greek, the word drugs pops up over and over again. And I already mentioned it is pharmakia, right? That word is present in the Old Testament, present in the New Testament. And 
Um, it's usually translated witchcraft, but like I said, this isn't a case of translator's choice. Um, so in other words, it's not like the example I've used in the past is if you came across the word bark, you'd have to decide, is it talking about the outer layer of a tree or is it talking about the sound a dog makes? This isn't like that. This is the word pharmakia meant drugs for spiritual purposes. As a matter of fact, um, I quote the lexicon, um, the Freeburg lexicon, for example, um, says the word pharmakia means one who prepares drugs and uses drugs for magical or ritual witchcraft, sorcerer, poisoner, magician. Another Lao Nida lexicon says um, the use of drugs for any kind of magical effects, sorcery, magic. Um, so that, that drug aspect to it is present throughout. And the Bible has that all the way throughout the Bible. And the warnings are not like minor warnings. They're not similar to, you know, some small sin, the warnings are unhinged. For example, in the book of Exodus chapter 22, verse 18, it says, do not allow the person who practices drugs for spiritual purposes to live. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, 10, it says, let no one be found among you. And this is an interesting verse because it ties together the sacrifice and the drugs that we were just talking about. It says, let no one be found among you who sacrifices his son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination, or sorcery, or who engages in pharmacos. So, wow. in, uh, you know, so yep. engages in that drugs for spiritual purposes. Um, and that's, that's throughout the Bible and including the New Testament. Um, and Paul talks about uh, the fact that people that do pharmacia will not um, be, uh, make it to the kingdom of heaven. So like there's extreme warnings for Old and New Testament. And like you mentioned, both the Old and the New Testament not only warn against it, they also have that corporate warning that it will lead nations astray. Mm -hmm. um, Nahum chapter three, verse four says um, that Nineveh enslaved nations by her prostitution and by her pharmaca. Yeah. Um, and then in Revelation chapter 18, verse 23, it says that all nations were deceived by pharmakia. Yeah. Um, and so there is that that warning over and over again. And the the thing I po also point out in um, a little bit in my book, and I touch on it in much more depth on my Substack, is that the apostolic fathers, um, which in um, Christian history are the fathers that were closely connected to the apostles. So those apostolic fathers, that first generation of Christians, they're all extremely explicit that pharmakia can't be used by right. uh, Christians. So um, the, there's, there's a consistency in the Bible, in the early church fathers, and in the later church, um, going all the way up uh, to modern day Christians, um, right. that pharmakia cannot be used by Christians. And so this Brian Murescu idea that, oh, you know, they used to use it and some stuffy Christians somewhere along the line want yeah. to get rid yeah. of it or whatever, that's simply not true. Um, and, um, so anyway, yeah, that's, yeah, that's it's the biblical case. True. Right? And it's tied to John Marco Allegro, Brian Morescu, and even this book that, uh, I, you know, I talk about a lot, the psychedelic gospels, which is written by Dr. Jerry, uh, Brown and his wife, Julie Brown, and highlights the existence of seemingly psychedelic, uh, Amanita Muscaria like frescoes and stuff within Christianity. Um, you know, here's, here's one in Germany right here, uh, uh, St. Michael's Church in Hildesheim, Germany. Yeah. And this was used to make an argument that the psychedelic gospels, that basically building upon John Marco Allegro, that the Eucharist was actually a psychedelic ritual. Mm -hmm. However, deeper analysis of the evidence presented in this book highlights that the only, uh, all the physical examples of the use of mushrooms relate to areas and time frames in which Gnostic heresies were on the rise. And so yeah. I wrote a, in one of my academic papers for, for uh, my research, I highlighted a whole section where um, Epiphanius, uh, Hippolytus, Irenaeus are doing polemics and highlighting the practices of these various Gnostic groups, of which there are tons. Gnosticism is not one thing. It's many, many different things highlighting that they were outspoken about them being the continuation of the Alicinian mysteries uh, using uh, the Borberites, for example, um, would engage in what we would deem as uh, the, if you're familiar with theistic Satanism, like they invert the Eucharist where they'll consume like a wafer with 
menstrual blood, fecal yeah. matter, stuff like this on it to, to demonstrate their ability to transgress boundaries. The Borberites did that. There's accusations about cannibalism. Uh, the Carpocratians practice orgiastic forms of sexuality. Homosexuality was okay because the idea that you weren't wanting to bring uh, people into the world to trap them into, again, this sort of prison. That Gnosticism is, is often by the people who promote that. Well, no, no, the Eucharist is really about psychedelics. It's often coming from people that conflate the differences between the actual church the, of the seven ecumenical councils, the historical church of Christ, and all these Gnostic groups. Uh, they, again, just like more rescue, he'll in one paragraph, he'll quote the gospel of Thomas and the gospel of John and not realize these are totally different traditions, different paradigms, pre different presuppositions, working on totally different um, understandings of how we engage with the world and come to relationships with God. And so Gnosticism absolutely was participating in these things, whether it be uh, abortion, ritual human sacrifice, the use of inebriating substances, orgiastic forms of sexual group activity. All this stuff was present in Gnosticism, which is the continuation of these serpentine traditions. The Ophites, literally the Ophites, worshipped the serpent. Before they would, before every ceremony, they would have to kiss the serpent. And, and so yeah. my point is, is yeah. highlighting yeah. exactly what we're arguing and that we must, for those listening who aren't aware, must keep a, the distinction yeah. between Gnosticism and the Christianity proper. The yeah, actual and, theology. And I'll go. I'll go further. It's there's there's Gnosticism that absolutely was pagan based, and it was ba you know there, this is not even a question. Like not it, even a question. It clearly was a paganized attempt to synthesize some Christian ideas with paganism. That is absolutely what it was. Um, but it is there. There's also that element of kind of that fake. Uh, unholy sacrament that also is present in Northern Europe in the um, witchcraft and paganistic religions, the Celtic Gaelic religions. Um, they also had that there is. And it's interesting. You see that parallel where they're attempting to take and almost mock the Christians uh, ceremonies, the sacraments trying to um, undermine and mock those um, with blending in this unholy sacrament, blending in this, um, this mushroom instead of that, uh, bread, you know, this, this wine that's been mixed with psychedelics with that wine. Um, right. and so you see that throughout the world and, um, you're right that when like Brian Muir rescue doesn't take care to say, okay, is this a Orthodox or unorthodox, um, group of people, um, that you miss, it becomes impossible to tell because, of course, there was always witchcraft. There was always uh, pagan tribes. There was always um, some sort of synthesized um, religion. There, there is everywhere you go, um, and there is today in modern day America. I mean, there's there's people that um, mix together Christianity with whatever pagan ideas they want to follow and um, to not take care right. there, right? To not be careful and say okay, is this really coming from Christianity or is this coming from some kind of pagan cult um, is um, just reckless to say the least. And um, the consistency of Christianity as in the Orthodox um, true faith um, yeah. to speak to these issues is unbroken. And yeah. you can't find any church father, you can't find any great saint that's promoting these things as an acceptable behavior. Yeah, it, 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 exactly. And the people who do often are ignorant of church history and of theology, generally speaking, philosophy and theology. This would be, again, my accusation against Morescu, who I believe is a lawyer who was trained in religion at a Jesuit high school and, and I think college. But his his profession is is that of a lawyer and just totally falls victim to the word concept fallacy that he can take any English word and then somehow equate it to, you know, multiple different traditions, languages, groups of people. I mean, no serious scholar would do any of that. But yet that's a that's a incredibly popular book, The Immortality Key. The and number of people after I wrote my book, the number of people that responded back when I kind of was warning against psychedelics responded back and they said, well, uh, early Christians did psychedelics. You should read Brian Muir rescue is crazy. Like I had like a hundred people tell me that I should read Brian Muir rescue, which I had already read and cited in depth in my book. So, right. 
Oh. And, and it's it, he, yeah, he brings up a lot of different things. He gets into Dian, Dionysian cults, Gnosticism, Alicinian mysteries, and then basically just brings together the general Gnostic narrative and then a ton of different sources to equate all this stuff as, as quote unquote Christian when it's not. And when you look at John Marco Allegro, the sacred mushroom and the cross, yeah, I don't disagree that there were Gnostic groups that equated Jesus Christ with, you know, inebriating substance, of course. But to equate that as the historical church is just an absolute lack of honesty, academic scrutiny, seriousness. And uh, and so that's why I feel like that book just really fell flat for me um, as as a potential source to even criticize i mean you can read r gordon watson and that stuff's much more serious academically than brian morescu and the immortality key whether you agree with our gordon watson or not that's a whole different thing but at least yeah it, i i have i i would agree with you that he's uh more serious um i do have concerns about our gordon watson oh me his, too his background is very uh, work for jp and, morgan uh, um, and that's where we get into the 1960s counterculture. And you're highlighting that the prevalence of marijuana smoking and stuff was so low amongst the American population. I mean, my personal opinion is this has to do with the CIA and a lot of the intelligence agencies pushing these things. Yes. Uh, yeah. T Timothy Leary was open that um, by the beginning of the 1960s, you know, 1963 is when he gets kicked out of Harvard with um, who becomes. Uh, Ram Das, but uh, Richard Alpert, because Richard Alpert was a closeted homosexual and he one of the boys that he was intimate with was an undergraduate and he was allowing them into the psychedelic research at Harvard. This was a big taboo. This was like one of the one things that Harvard said, no undergraduates, only graduate students are allowed to participate. Richard Alpert has an undergrad boyfriend, um, tries to get him into it. The word gets out. They shut down the whole psychedelic operation research center there in Harvard. So the end of 63, uh, moving into 1964 is when he goes up to Melbrook. But he is open that he was getting his LSD from the CIA, yeah. <laughs> that they yeah. were giving it to him. Even after, as you highlight in the book, the the the, the acts restricting drugs um, and, and limiting the availability of these things. Because in 1963, you could go to a head shop in San Francisco and buy acid and marijuana. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. The role of the CIA in promoting psychedelics is very weird and very provable. Um, there's a guy named Al Hubbard um, who clearly was working for the CIA, uh, clearly was, you know, the CIA never confirms or denies anybody, but he's got so many links to the CIA that he clearly was. And Al Hubbard was called the Johnny Appleseed of LSD. And he was friends with Timothy Leary. Um, he went around to every academic that there was, um, gave it to Aldous Huxley, gave it to um, pretty much uh, every big name. They, they say that they would wait around for him with, and, and he would bring a suitcase uh, for them to do their research with or for them to use however they wanted to use. So um, it is, the, the role of the CIA is weird. And R. Gordon Wasson, is right there in the mix. When he did his famous trip to Mexico, do you know who funded that trip and went with him? The CIA. <laughs> oh, I believe that. I yeah, yeah, they, they that. literally funded that trip. Um, that's in Annie Jacobson's uh, Phenomenon, which is a great book. Um, oh, but, I haven't uh, read that. Yeah, yeah it's um, so yeah, there's there's definitely some CIA ties there. But I agree, he's, he's more serious than Brian Murray Rescue. But Brian Murray Rescue is interesting. Wouldn't surprise me if he had a murky background as well. There's an article by Joe Welker. Um, about um, his experience in a trial, I believe it was at Johns Hopkins University, um, where he um, said that he was part of an effort to integrate religion and psychedelics um, that they were doing. They had like a, a group um, that was kind of pushing this and Brian Murrescu showed up in the story. He was just telling the story and Brian Murrescu was helping to push it into Christianity. The idea was to like normalize it within Christendom um, to, to try and get more and more Christians to be doing psychedelics. So there's no oh, question that. that there is some murky stuff going on there. And yeah, yep. Brian Murray rescue. I don't think he's a dumb guy. I think he's, a no, I don't guy. think he is and either. I think he wrote that book with a, an, an agenda yeah. and, you know, evidence to, to, to the side, he was going to tell that story no matter what he came up with. And he didn't come up with much. I, I went through that. I have a Substack article where I went through all his evidence and, 
you know, there's there's zero evidence that he came up with that orthodoxy in any way practiced uh, pharmacia. As it, exactly. Of, uh, yeah, it's services. it's a real stretch. Um, the other thing I wanted to, to mention is in regards to the counterculture, the CIA involvement. Um, Aldous Huxley is obviously an incredibly uh, prominent individual at the beginning of the 20th century as a catalyst for the psychedelic revolution. I mean, he's the one who uh, turned on, if you will, Timothy Leary and his book, uh, Cleansing the Doors of the Perception, really brought uh, to foreknowledge the mescaline LSD type experience. This was even before the 1957 Life article by R. Gordon Wasson. Well, his brother, Julian Huxley plays really prominent in my academic research on transhumanism. It's ironic that both eugenicists, uh, Julian and his brother Aldous, uh, they're two big promoting or they're two big contributions to the 20th century is the beginning of transhumanist philosophy with Julian Huxley talking about uh, a, 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 a what, what's he called it? A religion without revelation because this is a rational philosophy, but he's talking about the divinization of man through our technology. And then you have Aldous Huxley talking about uh, the cleansing the doors of the perception, using these inebriating substances. And you read Brave New World, you know, Soma is not exactly there to set you free. Yeah. And, and so I think there's some perniciousness even among some of the catalyst of these narratives in the 20th century and why they were writing what they were writing and how now in the 21st century we're living in the wake of all this stuff i mean we're talking about transhumanism <laughs> elon musk is open about using x x as a way to map discourse for people and and he owns Neuralink, you know yeah. a, a brain computer chip interface company and they're yeah. doing human trials um so all this stuff is inter connected and why the intelligence agencies would be interested in any of this is that it moves to the ultimate goal of, uh, of total control, total domination, a, a one world government that rules itself. And that's interestingly enough, again, what the mushrooms talk to Terrence McKenna about and how nationalism is a bad thing because it leads people to go to war and, and national identity and all these different things need to be eroded. Yeah. 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 There, the, um, the movement to, you know, you mentioned it earlier, tear down boundaries is true on so many levels. It's true men and women. It's true men and weird entities uh, from another realm. It's true with nations. It's true. I mean, like you go across the board and there's these tearing down of boundaries. And it reminds me of G.K. Chesterton's uh, fence, right? If the fence is there, um, don't tear it down until you know why it was there in the first place. And we're just tearing down fences when we do these uh, psychedelics. And it um, the the risk and the downside is um, hard to overstate. I mean, that's the crazy thing. So like when I talk to Christians about, you know, if you take cultural issues, uh, LGBT or take abortion or you take um, uh Second Amendment even, which isn't really even in that category, but you take these cultural issues and Christians are tuned in, right? They know the issues, they can debate them, they know how to talk to them or whatever. But then you bring up psychedelics or you bring up uh, the fact that we went from 4% of the population had tried marijuana in 1971 to 50% in 2023. You bring that up and people are, they're not even sure if it's wrong. Or they're not even sure. And, you know, I had somebody the other day that said, I'm a conservative, but I you know, believe in, you know, drugs or whatever. And like, it's like, no, you, you don't understand what this is. The risk here is giant. And um, the thing that I kind of have pointed out is that if it is what we're saying, if it is connecting you with dark entities, um, it could be the worst thing going on now. It could be bigger than any of those cultural issues um, if that's what it's doing on a mass scale. Um, it could be bigger than all those other things put together because things can always get worse, right? Like right. we always, we assume that, like, Hey, we've hit the bottom with all this craziness going on and it could be, I mean, go to imagine yourself being Cortez showing up and seeing what the Aztecs were doing, where they're sacrificing 250,000 people on stairs, throwing, you know, ripping their hearts out of their living body and rolling their body down the stairs. Um, that is, that's, it, it got there somehow, right? right? Like, and it got there 
in part by the help of psychedelics. I mean, that, Absolutely. The, the Spanish noted that they said that they would eat these mushrooms and then do the bad stuff. And that, that is something that is, um, needs to be reckoned with as a society. And I think to some degree or another, we're kind of sleepwalking into it. Right. No, I totally agree with that. And it's, again, it's the understanding of the spiritual warfare being in the imagination that the, the effects of the noetic realm, your imagination, your mind, this is really important. And this is the, this is the battleground of spiritual warfare. And, And most Christians don't think of it this way. And that's why they can't understand why these things would be bad. Uh, why, you know, why, and I'm not in you in the book, we're not dismissing how these substances can be beneficial in limited context for certain things. Yes, there is evidence for that, but for the general use of it at a spiritual level, there's a whole nother reality to this. And the ideas that people get, you know, look at transgenderism, look at a lot of the cultural things that are going on. Nobody taking psychedelics are going to say, oh, you know what? The psychedelics told me that this stuff's bad. No, it's all in favor of it. Yeah. It's the people Backing that have an, an experience right. of Christ or say, you know what, you know, Christ came to me and, you know, I, I'm stopping all that. Now I see how this is leading me into a different direction. Those are the people who are saying, hey, we have to actually watch out for this. This isn't a good thing. This is, you know, this is bad. This is detrimental. Not the people that are gung ho and fully, in, you know, endorsing this stuff. They're in favor of the agenda. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes the Hallmark greetings are not what society needs, right? Sometimes they love everybody and live in the moment, those kind of things. Sometimes you need to have discernment. Sometimes you need to say no. Sometimes you need to say that's wrong. Um, And you'll never hear that. You know, like you, you get into that psychedelic mysticism, you never hear those words. You never hear those strong words of, of hatred, except for the interesting thing is they have those, that, anger that hatred that you shouldn't do it when it comes to christian yes practices and you see that in brian Murray rescue you see that in graham hancock you see that yep. in all of these guys they're the most open accepting everything's good hallmark greeting until they get to christianity and right. then all of a sudden they're like this is the destruction of the world yep. you know but like in, in some ways brian Murray rescue talks about the fact that he believes the removal of psychedelics could be destroying the world. Like he, he talks about that in his book. Where he's and like, in the this- interview with Jordan Peters, he admitted that he's never done high dose psychedelic experience. That's what's yeah, really yeah. weird. When I was, I watched him do a conversation with Carl AP Ruck and Jordan Peterson, in which he talked about his book and, and Jordan Peterson's all gung ho. Cause he's had a bunch of psychedelic experiences that he deemed beneficial. Carl A.P. Ruck, I'm sure you're familiar with, famous uh, classicist scholar out of Boston who's been a his, li- his life career is the promotion of this in regards to myths and understanding it. And Brian's like, oh, yeah, but I've never done any of these things. And it's like, dude, you just wrote an entire book. And then, like you said, claiming the absolute central importance of psychedelics. And then you haven't done it like that seems like you said, it seems kind of weird. It seems like it was almost like the whole thing was an agenda. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think there is an agenda there. The the Jordan Peterson part is really interesting because if you watch old interviews with him, he was really against psychedelics. And he has completely flipped on that where he's now semi-promoting them. And I don't know what happened there. I'm not sure what um, drove that change. Um, but some I, you know, there's there's been a, a bad shift in his his thinking on that uh, for some reason or another. Um, but I think, you know, I, I think there's a, you know, if you look at it from uh, where are people going with these things, where, when people do psychedelics, what are the sorts of behaviors they engage in? I think those patterns are so clear and there's, you see it over and over again um, across cultures and across paths and i think that's where you know to get back to my warning is like uh, that's where we're we shouldn't sleepwalk into this because that the patterns are there and you see it over and over again so regardless i mean the the thing that you know a lot of people do is they'll argue with me of like hey i never felt this i never wanted to kill a baby i never wanted to do that i you know i'm a i have interestingly a lot of people that will say hey i wouldn't have come to christianity without psychedelics psychedelics helped me come to uh come to faith and um so you know people will come to me with those those statements and um 
they're interesting. And like I said, I, I don't think that you can never have a good outcome. Oh, right? absolutely. Uh, yeah. So, so in, in other words, that. and that's not true witchcraft as well. Like if you literally were, if we were like, Hey, let's do some witchcraft in here. Um, it's possible that magic could work and we could heal somebody. You know, if we were trying to heal our sick baby using witchcraft, possible it'd work. Possible there'd be a good outcome to it. Um, does that mean that people should say, hey, witchcraft is great? Does that mean people should embrace this behavior as a standard set of behaviors? And the answer is no, it should never absolutely ever be used. And it actually, even in those situations where it does something good, harm could come from that in the end. Um, if you've read... Um, C.S. Lewis is uh, the magician's nephew. Um, he has that very beautiful passage where the boy, the hero from the, the story, is given the temptation from the witch to take the apple back to his sick mother who's dying. Mm. And she says, you know, if you take this apple, she'll be healed. You know, she'll you can go back to her and heal. But he knew Aslan had told him not to take that apple. So he wrestles with it mentally and, you know, decides to obey Aslan, even though it's the death of his mother. And he goes back and he talks to Aslan and Aslan says, if you had brought that to your mother, she would have been healed, but it would have been the worst moment in her life and the worst moment in your life, because mm -hmm. the trade that you made of your soul, you know, he doesn't say this right. explicitly, but basically the trade that you made will sacrifice your relationship with her. It will destroy everything about you and her. Um, and so the good that you got from it is not worth the bad that ultimately will come from it. And I, I think that's very applicable to this where, you know, there's, that's how they're selling it, right? They're selling it of like, hey, it, you know, the studies at Johns Hopkins says it helps with anxiety or the studies here are, are you know, the University of Wisconsin-Madison are yeah. saying that it's, it's helping with people that have PTSD or whatever. And like, there's, so there's this promise of like, hey, it's, hel it's helping a little bit. And I think that um, we should be very skeptical to that because even if it's true, it could be like the horse and his boy where we're, we're accepting something that ultimately causes harm. And to go back to the witchcraft example, if you said, you know, let's say you went to Europe um, in, you know, and you talk to people that were like, if you read a, a very interesting book to read is uh, Malleus Maleficarum, um, which is the hammer of witches. It was yep. written in, in 1486, um, but he goes through a lot of the witch practices in there. But if you ask the author of that book, um, whether, witchcraft if, if you said hey witchcraft healed my anxiety you know i did it witchcraft and it healed my anxiety or i did witchcraft and it helped me with my my ptsd or i did witchcraft and it healed my kid therefore is witchcraft okay and he would you know would anybody in that era say it was okay and the answer right. is no of course not so like i i feel like we're doing that right now literally the word in the bible for witchcraft is pharmakia and we're saying pharmakia heals anxiety therefore it's okay Right. Well, and it's tied, it's tied to this fear of death, right? We as Christians are called to not fear death. And those living in a secular world, those living without uh, deep convictions, it's hard to not to be fearful. You know, I think one of the reasons why the substances are on the rise is to sedate oneself due to the chaos that's in the impending doom in the world. I mean, it's not like we're and necessarily a great space, even though those same people are going to believe that in progress, the lie of progress, and that we're the most progressed people in the world. And this is the, this is just the beginning of us moving further into utopia. And so the, the use of substances is a, is a way to sedate ourselves. Yeah. It's a way yeah, on that, on that point. Um, one of the studies I cite in my book, and I can't remember if it was Johns Hopkins or New York university, but one of the studies was specifically using psilocybin which is the chemical in mushrooms to deal with anxiety of people that were terminally ill so it was exactly to deal with death the anxiety related to death which you know as christians were like that should not be when you're taking drugs to like you know that's right. should, that's the worst possible moment to be be doing these things but i do agree for example me coming back to christ um i had already been working on things but the last time i took psychedelics was an ayahuasca ceremony where um, I felt Christ spoke to me, basically yeah. told me it was time to grow up. And all of a sudden the drug stopped working. 
And that was the beginning of me creating this YouTube channel and, and going, you know, creating content three times a week and devoting my life to trying to lead people to what I believe the truth is, is Jesus Christ and the Orthodox Church. And so I agree that people, like you said, you know, a lot of Christian people that maybe psychedelics are beneficial, but just because God can take negatives and make positives out of yeah. them doesn't mean that you needed the psychedelics yeah. to get to the end point. It's that you exactly. got into yeah. a situation and then he yeah. used the context of where you were to get you to a new point. Yeah. For example, yeah. when I was deep into the psychedelics, I wouldn't have trusted uh, doing rational philosophy to come to a worldview in which I would give up psychedelics. Um, yeah. I needed to be enamored and engrossed in ecstatic, euphoric ayahuasca high, and it just to turn off and basically tell me it was time to grow up. It's time to create and not consume. And Christ was a carpenter and he built things. He healed people. He went out and did, uh, did things. And I was a consumer I, and I kept consuming. And, I, and I, I think we look at most of the men in our society is they're continuing to be consumers. And you look at the the substances and sitting on your couch, playing video games, smoking weed, getting high, doing things for fun. You're just a passive consumer. Yeah. And I think many it, it, it prevents us to mature into really the men that we're called to be. It, it, it's a it's a neotenizing effect and a feminizing effect. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know many truly uh, masculine men that are handling their responsibilities that are, again, also engaging in in inebriation constantly and all the time. You know, when I was smoking weed, I smoked weed every single day. When I did psychedelics, I was doing psychedelics, you know, every few months doing high doses, really high doses. And so God can meet us wherever. And and, yeah. and, be, and we're talking about psychedelics dissolving the barrier between us right now in the noetic realm doesn't mean that angels are also in the noetic realm. Yes, demons are in the noetic realm. And that's the point is how do you know who you're encountering to be good or bad? One, you'd have to have faith in Christ and ask them about Jesus Christ. I did a I did a uh, a conversation with your mate Tom who has like a huge psychedelic YouTube channel, and I think he's back to doing psychedelics. But when we had a conversation, he was very much interested in Christianity because he had a terrifying experience with a shaman in Peru, where he could feel the demonic energy of this man. He was trying to sexually touch some of the women there, where they were all under the aegis of, of ayahuasca. And he felt like he was being attacked by spirits. And in the conversation we had, he said that he called out to Jesus Christ. And that was the only and he was a non-believer. But that was the first time where he saw like these entities were prevented from harming him. This gave him a, new, a renewed interest in, in Christianity. And I've heard this multiple times. You can go on YouTube and find all these stories of people who at one point as non-believers, as psychonauts, people engrossed within the psychedelic mysticism and spirituality, all of a sudden they are, start getting attacked. And, and just out of a reflex, they call out to Jesus Christ. And now there's a protection. There's a barrier there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's no question that... Um, God can reach us in our sin, in our bad moments, in our um, difficulties, in our struggles. Um, you know, I've talked to people that have found God as they're going through a divorce, or I've found, I've, I used to do prison ministry. I've talked to people in prisons um, that, you know, had committed very bad crimes that found God after realizing their own sin through finding God. So yeah, God is perfectly capable of finding us while we're in psychedelics or while we're in um, these, these uh, doing things that we're not supposed to be doing. Um, but it ultimately doesn't change that we shouldn't do them. Right? So, right. You know, like ultimately it's not like, Oh, I found God in a divorce. So I'm going to divorce my wife. You know? So like, um, you know, we, we should always seek to follow God um and and live according to his will which obviously precludes using pharmacia um but at the same time yeah of course god can use it and he does you know yeah i want to as we, we kind of wrap up our conversation one let everybody know if you want to support and show some love feel free to send in a super chat using the streamlabs link or here on youtube uh either one i'd be greatly greatly appreciative of uh, you can show some love and support that way. But now I want to return to the rise of the dragon, the rise of the serpent. Speak now to the contemporary moment as a Christian and the call to be a sort of St. George, the slayer of the dragon. What does that what does it mean to 
slay the dragon if the if the dragon is returning as you're highlighting as these ancient practices and really an entire paradigm of reality that people don't think right they can think that they all oh, i'm i'm psychedelic and i'm a republican i'm psychedelic and i'm a democrat socialist or i'm a communist and they don't yeah. realize that many of the subtleties of their presuppositions are all part of the same paradigm yeah. uh, this takes philosophical thinking this is something that most people aren't trained to think in these ways but this is really what's happening and this is what you're highlighting in your book as the rise of the serpent the rise of the dragon this is the rise of an ancient spiritual warfare that people just are, aren't aware of speak a little bit to the, again, you, you can start with St. George or whatever. I, again, I love it. You're going through all the, the serpent imagery in the Bible, uh, St. Patrick speak yeah. a little bit to the biblical imagery of, of the serpent, uh, if you will, and the rise of this, and then why we need to, you know, think of St. George and slaying of the dragon in the contemporary moment. Yeah. So, um, as, as we talked about, all these ancient religions had these serpents, they had these drugs for spiritual purposes, they had this human sacrifice that was like that dark triad was present throughout all of history. The interesting thing is all these stories, St. George. So what St. George did was he went to the city. There was a dragon that was terrorizing the city by demanding a human sacrifice. Yep. And he wanted to sacrifice the princess. And St. George went and slayed the dragon and saved the princess. Um, you see that 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 over and over again. And a lot of these stories is they slay the dragon who was demanding human sacrifice over and over again. Yep. Um, St. Patrick went to Ireland and what did he do? He drove out all the serpents. My well, patron saint, by the way. Lord yeah. St. Patrick. is <laughs> awesome, man. Um, St. Patrick went to Ireland, drove out all the serpents. Well, um, they have never found serpent or, or snake bones in right. Ireland. So what was he doing? Well, I think he was, getting rid of the serpents. Right. But the interesting thing, and I quoted um, uh, ancient historians, uh, a, uh, uh, somebody I think in the year 800 was talking about what St. Saint uh, Patrick accomplished. And he mentioned that he did three things. He got rid of the serpents. He got rid of the demons and he got rid of the witches. <laughs> he got mm -hmm. rid of the, you know, so like he went there and he fought against the serpent and he got he went on offense and he got right. rid of it and prevented it from happening. And um, I think in today's world, Christendom has for so long not had this like it's right. so long. It just hasn't been part of it. And yet, as everything we've talked about, whether it's the CIA or have like Ellis or Terrence McKenna or our garden Watson, um, all the way through Brian Murray rescue doing weird stuff well, and with, Jason Silva you know, now and the and maps. Joe, I mean, honestly, Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan. Um, Joe Rogan is probably the, the biggest the, one. And by far, I would say yeah. the biggest. You know, he is a guy that has normalized things that should not be normalized. Yeah. Pocket um, pussies over, and psychedelics. Yeah. So <laughs> very, yeah, very dark um, normalization. But so here at Christendom hasn't had this for 1900 years. And now all of a sudden it's rising again. This serpent is coming back. You have Graham Hancock saying, I've seen the, the serpent human entity you know you mentioned you'd seen yeah. it so many people that i've talked to have seen it it's rising again it's coming back and i think that one thing that christians um have historically done has been bad at dealing with stuff like this we get defensive or we get too intellectual or whatever but i i think there is a need just to be on the offense about it to, to think like St. George or to think like St. Patrick, where we say, we're not going to do this. We're not going to let this serpent rise again. We can't allow this. And I, as with everything, I think it starts in your family. You needs to be clear with your children. It needs to be clear with um, the people that you love and the people that are around you. Um, but it also goes, expands and circles beyond there to your community, to your church. Um, ultimately at the legislative le level, I think it's very important. I don't, I'm not a libertarian on these issues. I don't yeah. think you can say, yeah, everybody drink this demon stuff and you'll be fine or whatever. And I'll just deal with my own family. It's not going to work out for you. Um, I think there needs to ultimately be legislative protection and that is happening fast. The normalization of this, the, the, if you look at all the curves of like attitudes, practices, laws, all that stuff, 
it's becoming normalized faster than any other thing. And we talked about other cultural issues like LGBT or you talk about abortion or whatever. This is one that is changing faster than any of those other views. And that's hard to believe, but it is changing faster than all those views. And I think guys like Joe Rogan are kind of on the conservative side of things. So people, yeah. I think he's done a lot to take young men who would otherwise be conservative and say, well, I think psychedelics are okay. Or I think I'm going to try ayahuasca, or I think I'm going to try psilocybin. Um, and I think that this is the fight that we're in. And um, honestly, sometimes I feel like a voice crying in the wilderness just because nobody else is doing like, no, we need more voice. You've done a good job, but like we need more voices calling this out and yeah. making this clear that this isn't a, this isn't a brain phenomenon. This isn't just a, us having an interesting experience that we come back and we talk about, this is something much darker that ha could have much negative, much bigger and much greater negative consequences on society than anything else going on. Yeah. I think as you highlighted, I, I, I think it's only going to become more popular. Uh, maybe there'll be, I, I, God willing, I hope there'll be an ebb and flow to the things that are occurring right now. I'm sure there will be to some degree, but it also seems like there's the people who are behind the levers of power around the world seem to be moving uh, quickly in a direction where the most we can do is call those with eyes to see and ears to hear and move in the right direction. Because I think for a lot of people, you know, you're talking about the Joe Rogan and in his promotion of these things, you know, what is it, 2014, that gay marriage became illegal in the United States? Now look at where we are. Uh, drag queen story hours and uh, puberty blockers for children as young as five, six, eight years old. Uh, what's going on? I mean, that that escalated pretty darn quickly. And and I think if we are not careful with the, the substance abuse, that is another form of, of, a, of an entrapment. And it's, it's another form. And that's where Christ is calling us to a liberation by not being dependent upon anything in the world. And if you're dependent upon taking, you know, five dried grams or three, five hits of acid or however many cups of ayahuasca or how many hits of DMT you have to take. Well, you're in a trap, especially a spiritual trap. And that was, you know, and getting glory to God to helping me out. But eventually I got to a point where I had all the drugs I wanted, the DMT, the psilocybin and um, the LSD. And I got done one time trying to do a high dose uh, psilocybin with, you know, it was like six or seven dried grams, eyes closed uh night trying to contact you know these entities for insight for information and i came down from it i was like is this it is this the is this what i've been working for because at that point i was kind of like five years into oh yeah psychedelics gnosticism mystery traditions eastern mysticism i was again just moving through my my academic studies and i'm in my phd program in berkeley california with all the drugs i could want and it's like man this this feels like this can't be it if it is it's like i, I felt so let down because I had done all the experiences that they, you know, I was promised were going to lead me to this point of spiritual illumination. And, and it wasn't until I started to give those up. It wasn't until I started to become more disciplined in my life, praying, focusing on really a, what we would consider a Christian orientation spirituality, that things got more meaningful. And I realized it's not as fun and glamorous. I was talking about this with somebody recently who's come back to Christ out of the new age and all the psychedelic stuff recently from an ayahuasca ceremony actually he did an ayahuasca ceremony a few months ago in peru and christ came to him told him it was time to grow up told him that it was and what he do he went and proposed to his girlfriend now his fiance and been doing all these steps to mature focusing on his career uh you know marrying his girl thinking about the future planning for a house, like all these different things where before he was just this consumer. And so he had this radical transformation. And my point is eventually you get to this realization where the psychedelics, yeah, it's fun. Some of the most ecstatic experiences I had and laughing and fun times that were probably related to drug use with friends, but the meaning and the depth of my life was so superficial. And so as you, and you may have all these synchronicities, you know, anybody who's taken drugs know that weird, weird, strange things happen. The casuistry of the world is altered in some way. Like the most random thing, the most unlikely thing is probably the most likely thing to happen to you when you get into those altered spaces. But when you get sober, when you follow Christ, when you try to take things more seriously, 
God's providence emerges in your life and it's not as fancy, as glamorous, as euphoric as the drugs provide you. But as you work on your life and you work on true spirituality and you work on your relationship with God, it is no question that you can feel this journey that you think you're on with the drugs becomes much more real yeah. because now it's your actual sober life. It's your sober yeah. reality and you can feel God working in your life and it takes real intention. It takes real work. And once you get on that journey, which you can't give to somebody, right? You, I can give all the rational arguments, but that's a turning of your heart. That's deciding, you know what? I'm going to try to do everything the right way. And once you start going down that path, um, I think God pretty much makes it clear. Not that you're not going to ebb and flow and fall back into sin and bad practice. You usually do. But now you know the difference and you know the depth. And that's where psychedelics seem like there's so much depth when you first get into them. And then for me, you do them for six years and you do everything that you can do is the most amounts that you can do. And it's like, man, it's really not much here. It, it's not as deep as I thought it was. It's kind of superficial. And you know what? They, I'm getting ideas that I really don't think are true or, or don't, don't aren't related to me or, you know, how I want to, how I would want society to be like, again, not having children or the abortion or all this different stuff. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. The, um, the thing I tell people is, so psychedelics are our effort to kind of get to heaven, our effort to see into that spiritual realm, yeah. interact with those spirits, etc. cetera. Um, the true Christian way is for God to step into our world. Right. So if you exactly. look at what Jesus did is Jesus came down for us and there's, this world is where we're supposed to be. We're not supposed to take a drug to try and get to heaven. We're, we're supposed to experience God in this world. And that is best done in church, taking the sacrament. That's best done it, with your family, um, loving your kids, loving your wife, loving uh, your neighbors around you, um, taking a walk in the fall and smelling the cool air and seeing the trees um, and, um, experiencing this world that God gave us. That's how we're supposed to experience God. We're not supposed to take a drug to go see him. Um, yeah. And I think that as just like with anything good, the way you cheat to try and get there um, ends up being a false path. Um, the only way to get there is, is to take the steps it's not always as fun, right? Like it's not always as quick. It's not always as insightful. You don't always feel like you're learning and you're actually interacting with God. It's, as you said, it's step by step by step by step. And it's a journey that you go on and you'd love to go back and get that shortcut of like, Hey, I can take this, this mushroom. And all of a sudden here I am experiencing God. Um, but it's, it's a truer path. It's like, right. it, it's, it's a, um, it's, the difference between learning to climb a mountain and climbing a mountain on a video game <laughs> or, right. you know, it's, it's, it's a deeper thing that we experience and it's a needed thing. And um, so my, my statement to anybody that's doing psychedelics or anybody that is interacting with it is to echo what you said is like, once take, get off it and start to experience the world that God gave you um, because that's where he wants you to be. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, couldn't agree more. And, and you take that and it will, uh, it will transform your life. If you're sincere about it. I always tell people, if you really want to know the truth again, pray and talk to the creator of the universe, how, again, maybe you're not a Christian yet do a, a silent prayer to yourself away from people in all sincerity and talk to the creator of the universe as it is the creator, not, not your homeboy, not, not your buddy, but the actual creator of the universe and watch what happens. And, uh, that, that was my experience. So, yeah, brother, I want to thank you so much for uh, coming on. Is there anything you want to uh, say or highlight? Again, the book is The Return of the Dragon, um, The Shocking Way Drugs and Religion Shape People in Societies. Anything you want to promote or let people know where they can find you? Yeah, uh, definitely check out that book. Um, it's worthwhile. You know, we didn't go through um, kind of the step-by-step -step argument that I made. So check it out. Um, if you're skeptical of the argument, just give the book a chance, go through it. Cause I really tried to anticipate arguments, go through it. So check that out. Um, another thing people can do is follow me on Substack, lewisungit.substack.com. 
Um, I write articles on this subject and similar subjects. Um, I have a bunch of additional information on a lot of the stuff we just talked about, stuff that's not in the book. So people should follow me on Substack. It's free right now. I'm not asking for subscriptions or anything, but uh, if you uh, subscribe to the free email, you get the uh, articles when I publish them and uh, a lot of interesting stuff that I'm sure people will enjoy. And other than that, yeah, just thank you so much for having me on. Um, it was a lot of fun talking about this and uh, appreciate the, the opportunity to talk. Well, thank you, brother. Right here, uh, Yahoo just says, I needed this. I was planning on taking mushrooms soon, but I don't think I will. And that, right. that, that's good, man. Because uh, realize once you get into the, those states, uh, again, I've been into it a lot. Uh, you know, you can't turn it off. So when, once the once the tryptamine hits, uh, if you're going to do mushrooms, I assume it'll psilocybin. Once the tryptamine hits, uh, you know, you're on. That's why it's called a trip. You can't get off the ride until the ride ends. And you don't know, you, you know, you, you open yourself up to these realities and you don't know how it's going to go. Obviously, set and setting is a huge thing. You know, Leary talked about this, the whole 60s counterculture. And I would agree, you know, you go into a chaotic set and it's going to radically inform your experience of said substance. But um, uh, <laughs> yeah, ZD said, I tried lucid dreaming the other night and a voice in my head told me, go uh, to go to sleep. Yeah. That's that was probably a good message. That's another thing. Uh, lucid dreaming. I've heard people have some pretty demonic experiences with, but um, I appreciate your work. Uh, we got a few super chats real quick. Uh, looks like we got one actually. Uh, just want to reiterate, shout out to our sister, Rachel Wilson for renewing her membership and big congratulations on the 20 K my friend. Yes. Like I said, we're going to have a 20 K subscriber celebration this Sunday. Um, so celebrating the fact that we finally made it 20,000 subs. Uh, so thank you so much, Rachel for that. And then we had a super chat by anonymous who threw in $5 and said, keep up the good work exclamation mark. Well, thank you so much anonymous for the $5 super chat. I do appreciate it, uh, very much. And that looks like that is the Super Chats. Uh, Lewis, thanks again, man. I will let you go. Keep up the good work. Uh, if you want, you can message me your Substack link, and I'll put it in the video description for people so they can check cool. that out. Yeah, I'll do that. Okay. All right. Thanks All right. again. Yeah. Thank you, brother. Uh, as I said, I will be back um, potentially tomorrow or Saturday, but definitely Sunday with a 20K subscriber celebration stream. So I will see you all then. As always, until then, God bless.